Well, good morning, church. Good morning again. Um, the past couple of weeks <clears throat> have been nice for our family to be able to get away for a little bit. I thank all of you who helped and pitched in to lend a hand to uh, keep things running smoothly while we are gone. And we will dismiss the children for Sunday school and teachers as well. I could blame that on being out of the loop for a couple of weeks, but that wouldn't excuse all the millions of times I've forgotten it before that. So we'll just say, you may go. Thank you. We do, we need one of those signs in the back that can like read something across the back wall. Do, 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 do. The sermon's too long, do, 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 stop, stop. The kids have to go, do, do. don't forget the offering. Not that those things have ever happened, but. Like I said, the last couple of weeks have been good for our family to, to get away. And I know with leaving uh, you in the, the hands of Teen Challenge and Dan Cross, I know that the word has been preached and the message has gone out. The gospel has been proclaimed clearly. Those two, probably even more so than many others, their main focus to show that the word of God is alive, <laughs> that we need to cling to him and that he changes lives. So it's, I know that the past Sundays have been good, but I've missed being here. Uh, we were up in Maine for a couple of weeks for our end of summer family getaway, and it was nice and relaxing. We went to a, a church up there called Hope Baptist Church. Couldn't even get away from the Hope Church. Still had to find one. It was actually really nice, and coincidentally, the pastor there is preaching through Jesus, going through the Gospels. So what are the chances, right? That's kind of like the Uganda thing. When you see God doing the same thing over and over and over everywhere you look, it gives you confidence. This is not just men, because men can't coordinate on this level. No matter how many Elsies you have with their administration skills or Kellys to coordinate things, it's not possible for us to do things on the scale and the scope that God does. And so it was just encouraging. So we went and um, I believe the pastor was talking about, um, oh, I'm not going to remember, forget the, the miracle that he was going through now, but he's actually in exactly the same place in Jesus' ministry uh, that we are now. And I do, I'm drawing a blank on it. So that, there you go. Calming the storm. Thank you, wife. Two are better than one. If one can't remember, two can be there to lend some brain cells. Um, but I'm excited to get back because I have a confidence that this place is where God has called our family to be. And so whether things go well or go not well, whether things are smooth in our family's life or in the church's life or in the community, that to me isn't going to determine whether we're in the right spot or not. God's put us here. And so when things are tough, that just means that God has tough things for us, and so be it. He's allowed. And when things are good, then we rejoice because we know that he's blessing because he's in charge, and we're thankful. So it's nice to be here. It's like the round peg going back into the round hole. Uh, it's, it, it fits. And my prayer for you all is that you have that place as well, whether it's art and a ministry that way, like Christine has, um, or many other ways. I pray that you find that place that God is putting you to use you because he doesn't just desire to bless us so that we can receive. He desires to fill us and equip us so we can serve, so we can serve other people, um, make this world a better place and give him the glory in the process. So to step back into our sermon series is no great departure. We're still talking about Christ. We're still walking through his life, his footsteps. We're finishing up the middle section of Jesus' ministry, all these different miracles and then moving on to Jerusalem and the cross. Um, but the, the miracle, the amazing thing that we have to focus on today is Jesus' feeding of the 5,000, Jesus' multiplying of the loaves and fishes. Um, and different in some ways than some weeks, I don't want to bounce around in Scripture this morning. I want to settle down, and I want to read one passage, and I want to dig into it, and I want to think it through, I want to pray it through. So would you turn to John chapter 6 with me? Um, as, even as you're turning, just let me say a quick word of prayer to ask God to speak through his living word, and then we'll just read together and hear what Jesus has to say. Father God, it's good to sit at your feet. Jesus, we come to you as our author, our perfecter, our pioneer, our advocate, our older brother, the firstborn among us, our redeemer, so many things that you are, and we just want to say that we love you this morning, and we thank you for your love a love that puts food on our table and multiplies loaves and fishes, the love that puts life into our, our spirit and multiplies that life. And I pray that you would feed us this morning. 
I pray that you'd feed us your word, and I pray that it would be food for our soul, and I pray that we would come to life even more. Only you can do that, Lord. So I just ask you to speak through your word this morning in a powerful way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 6. Just read with me, please. I'm in the NIV here, but whatever translation you're reading, uh, I can follow along. Ah. It's so good to just hear Jesus. Let's just hear him speak. These are not my words. These are his, They're his actions. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. We're in John chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, that is the Sea of Tiberias, John clarifies for his readers. So obviously this wasn't written for someone just in our era. It was written for those right at his time so this letter could be circulated, this gospel tell about Christ. So he's telling the readers, you know the Sea of Galilee, or maybe if you're a Greek or a Roman citizen, you know the Sea of Tiberias? He's placing Jesus in a place because Jesus walked those shores and talked to these crowds. And that can be easy for us to forget sometimes because we're so far removed. But he's talking to people saying, you know, over in Brockton this happened. No, Jesus over in the Sea of Tiberias. Jesus crossed to this shore. And a great crowd of people, we're not talking tens, we're not talking hundreds, we're talking thousands of people followed him. Picture this huge mass of people kind of walking along the shore, walking along the, the little hillside there. Why did they follow him? They are following because they saw the signs he had performed healing the sick. So in this particular instance, these people are coming to Jesus because they have physical needs and they've seen that he's the kind of person that can handle those needs. Sometimes we come to Jesus because we want good advice. Sometimes we come to Jesus because we're desperate and nothing else has worked. Um, sometimes we come to him because we have a need. We've been diagnosed with something and we need to pray about it. We broke something and we need to pray about it. We're at a loss or something. These people are coming because they saw his healing. I know many of us have come in that same way. Ray, I think of you a few years back with those multiple infections and being in the hospital. In those moments, you come before God saying, I might die. I think I could use some help. So who do we go to? You come to your neighbor? No, in those times we come to Jesus because he's qualified. That's not all he does, but that's why these people are coming to him. They wanted physical, tangible help. Like, don't give me this religion. Don't give me this theology stuff, this theoretical stuff. I need healing. I need food. Show me. Help me. And Jesus does. He always has compassion. He always helps in every way. So, as crowds are swarming up, Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up, saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, he chose Philip. He doesn't just say to his disciples, he chose Philip. So this is a statement for Philip. We can learn about this. Some of us may be like Philip. Jesus has something to say to Philip. Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him. For he already had in mind what he was going to do. Did Jesus not know where he was going to find the food? Did he not know how things were going to work out? No. Well, then why ask Philip? It's a setup. Philip, what's going to happen? I already know the answer, but you can see if you can get it right. No, he knows Philip's heart. It's like, Philip, what do you think is going to happen? Philip, in your human understanding with your personality, your worries, your gifts, your strength, whatever, how do you envision God meeting this need? Because that's where we are often, right? We have our human wisdom, our, our, our ideas laid out on the table for us, and how do we think this is going to happen? So Jesus asks, but it's a test to be asked that question because ultimately we don't get to decide how it's going to happen. We just have ideas and steps of faith and prayers and thoughts. Christ is the one who knows. He's the one who will provide, but he asks us to test us where our faith is. And it's not a mean test. <laughs> it's not cruel. That's not unfair. That's good for us to say, okay, well, where do I think my food is going to come from? So Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. His answer is, this is not fiscally possible, dear Lord. So he answered with a money answer. And so you wonder, is that why Jesus asked him? Did he put too much stock on the money? Maybe. Or maybe he was just a logical person, so he answered logically. Maybe it wasn't money-focused, but he was detail-focused. 
Either way, he's thinking at the human level with the logistics and the resources at hand. And he's not wrong, but he's limited then to the earthly options that he's got. There's no divine option, there's no God option if what you're looking at is the money you have and the people you have. Philip answered, this is what it would take. So in essence, I don't see a way to make it happen. Unreasonable goal. Another of his disciples has an answer. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew says, well, here's a boy with five barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? He's kind of a step closer to faith versus just logic, if we could separate those two, which don't need to be separated. But in this case, with Philip, they have become separated. He only sees the logic of it and doesn't have that faith. Andrew's a little bit different. I see a little food, but it's not enough. So I see some help, but it's not going to be enough. So there's still not that full faith. But not even as much faith, even though it is. It's just, I don't see. I don't see it. I don't know how it could happen. How could God take so little and make it much? So Jesus said, okay, class is in, students. Have the people sit down. This is what we're going to do. There's plenty of grass in that place. So we're, we've got water, we've got the grass, we've got the mountainside, and we've got about, as it says, 5,000 men there. Jesus took these loaves, five small barley loaves, and he gave thanks. Thank you, God for teeny tiny little breads to feed to 5,000 people. It's like a wrong prayer, a logical prayer. Thank you that I have not enough for what we're about to do. Thank you that this is going to fail miserably. Thank you that this doesn't make any sense. Thank you that all these people are probably laughing at me as I pass out these five bitty pieces of bread. Thank you, God, because you provide. God provides. Thank you, God, for what we have. Give us what we need. So he took the loaves, he gave thanks, and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And they did the same with the fish. The other Gospels talk about baskets, right? Distributing them, taking them out. The other Gospels have a few different accounts of this. There's a feeding of the 4,000, a feeding of the 7,000. Um, in one of the Gospels, Jesus said, didn't you see when I fed the 4,000? Didn't you see when I fed the 7,000? He kind of lists them sort of side by side, so these aren't conflicting accounts. This is something that Jesus did even more than once. Now, how cool is that? He's not looking to just make his statement. Like, do you remember that time? It's like, oh, here's more hungry people. I can feed them. Let's care for these people. He was there to meet physical needs as well as to be a spiritual savior. He was not a political savior. He wasn't giving them the nation they wanted, but he cared about the physical needs of the individual people. We don't come to God just as a group. We come to him one heart to one heart individually. He cares about each and every one of us. So he distributes this via his disciples to all the people. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and they filled these 12 baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. They were so overwhelmed by the power they saw, they wanted to make him king by force. They will take him, they will proclaim him the new king and they will mass march maybe on Jerusalem, on the local Roman outpost, whatever was closest, and they will start this victory with him as their figurehead. He's this powerful man. Look what he can do. Um, I know early on in the series, which is now probably three years ago, um, we talked about some of the false messiahs that had come just before Christ. There were several of them. One of them was a, um, I guess the only way I could say is a pseudo-priest. Um, but set himself, up, uh, set himself up as a priest, his name is Thutis, and gathered some followers to him and said, come with me, we're going to leave this Roman-occupied area, we're going to go down to the Jordan River, God is going to part it for us the same way that Moses parted the Red Sea, God parted for him, we're going to cross over into the wilderness, we're going to be free of these Romans, I am your Savior. He proclaimed himself that, he was not. So they march down, people are getting riled up like this, the crowd seeing this man who's proclaiming something powerful, something they want to see, and they follow him down to the Jordan River. And it doesn't part, and the Roman soldiers come, and they kill them all. 
This is the sort of thoughts that are in the minds of these people following Jesus. Is this the one? Oh, there's been so many failures before this, so many letdowns, so many people who said they could fulfill on their promise and then just failed to fulfill again and again and again. So they want to believe, but they want what they want too. They just want someone who can feed them. They want someone who can heal their sickness, that they can be healthy, they can be well fed. You know, their interests aren't necessarily God's interests. Remember that verse that says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What's better, to live like a king on earth and rot in hell? <laughs> to put it bluntly, that's kind of how that phrase goes. So Jesus isn't satisfied to leave them with this, but he does feed them. This is the lesson. Like God does feed us. Lord's Prayer, give us our day, this day our daily bread. He feeds us every day. He puts food on our table. He's compassionate. He wants to meet our physical needs. But that's not the point of life, just to get our needs met and then die. We've got this whole spirit inside of us, a soul that's hungry in the same way that our body is, gets thirsty, gets tired. Anybody here ever felt a tired soul? Oh, well, that's it? Liars. <laughs> that feeling where just your heart is heavy and you're, you're just done for. Right? Well, that needs to be fed. Who's going to feed your soul? Good thing Market Basket is back in business. We can get our soul fed at a discounted price. No, no, there's no way except for God. God's the spirit that fills our spirit. That's it. So Jesus says, you're coming to me because you just want food, and I want to give that to you. I want to put food on your table. I want you to be fed. I'm going to take care of you. But it's not the most important thing. So let's keep reading. All right? This is a lesson, but it's not the lesson. Jesus then walks on water in this next instance, but actually the walking on water is between two portions that we're going to bring together. So we're going to skip verses 16 through 24 and go right to verse 25. So it's still John 6, but now down at verse 25. <clears throat> verse 24, 24 actually. Once the crowd realized that neither, neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, because he's out busy walking on water, um, they got into boats, because they couldn't walk on water, and they went to Capernaum in search of him. The crowd is still following him. They want more food. They want a king. They want him to make this life a better place. Give me the things I want that will make me happy. Make us victorious now in all sorts of earthly ways. And he's like, yeah, I want to meet your needs, but you don't quite get it. When they find him, he throws everything that they thought right on his head. He just twists it around and says, are you sure that you know what you want? And are you sure you know who I am, what you're going to get if you come to me? So this is what they find. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You want free food. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you this food. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Do not spend all our time and energy for the food that we eat here. That just comes, goes, rots, and is done. Don't. It's foolish. It's short-sighted. Spend our time in this world for things that will last beyond it. Amen. And when you put it out like that, doesn't it seem like well, that's sort of an obvious thing? Well, how do we go about doing that? How do we spend our lives in this world not just treading water. Coincidentally, Jesus would be happy to answer that question for us this morning. Verse 28, they said, what must we do to do the works God requires? All right, Jesus, you have our attention. What do we have to do? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, believe the one he has sent. It's harder to believe. It's going to take effort to just trust Jesus. And by you working or striving, you're not going to make his words any more or less clear or valuable. They just are what they are. Our work is to believe him. Do you believe? Do I believe Jesus? Do we love him? 
Do we believe him? Do we want to be with him? Do we know what it feels like when we actually talk to him or read something that he said and we feel ourselves, what's that hymn? The things of this world become strangely dim. If we feel warmed, that's not just some over-emotional reaction that we're having. That's a connection with Christ. And it's good. We will become more loving people if we spend time with Jesus. We will get healed if we spend time with Jesus. Notice I didn't say attend church on Sundays. That can be part of it, but that's not it. It's spending time with Him. So what do you have to do? Believe Jesus. So they said, they asked him, what sign then will you give that we might see the sign and believe you? What will you do? After he just fed 5,000 people. They're showing that they don't believe. And it's going to be, what have you done for me lately with this crowd? Okay, so you fed us yesterday. What about today? That's not faith. Faith is you shown me, and I believe, and you will continue to provide. So they quote the Old Testament. They quote back to the Jewish history, how God called the Jewish people. They went into captivity in Egypt, and he called them out. He used Moses to lead them out. They come out. They cross the Red Sea because God was with Moses. Even though he wasn't with Thutis, Moses was not making things up. Moses was just listening to God and following. So God leads his people out. He uses Moses. He parts the Red Sea. He brings them to the wilderness. <clears throat> And it's been 40 years mocking God and 40 years complaining to him, 40 years arguing, 40 years wishing they were free of God so they could go back to their luxuries because in Egypt things were easier. They had enough bread to eat. And so he takes the faithful, the next generation, into the promised land. Out of the promised land, we have the kingdom that he promised. Jesus comes from King David. Jesus then brings us the life in Christ. There's this whole plan that God's got laid out. So they go back to one specific instance and says, all right, well, there's a sign that the people were supposed to follow Moses and that God was going to give them what they needed. And it was that manna, quail too, but verse 31 says, Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. When they woke up every morning, there were these flakes of some stuff on the ground, and they would eat it. It was kind of bread-like, and it sustained them. They couldn't save it. It was one day at a time, daily bread with the manna. You couldn't store it, or it rotted. There'd be maggots in it the next morning. God gave them daily bread every single day. And they say, as it is written, quoting scripture, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So God sustained them because they were his people. Well, Jesus says, okay, let's work with that. That's the example you've chosen. Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. So don't come to me as being the one to give you something. It is my Father who gives you the true bread. So Moses didn't give you manna. God gave you manna. I'm not going to give you physical bread. God's going to give you me. I am what God has given you follow? It's not Jesus giving the manna. God gave the manna. God gave Jesus. It was not Moses, verse 32, who has given you the bread from heaven. It's my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This happens on a practical level every day because wheat and barley and oats, they grow. God gives bread to the world. If he didn't grow those things, if there were no plants, he would not, we would not eat. He provides those things. He provided miraculously in the manna, and Jesus is showing what God gives keeps us alive. <clears throat> Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you don't believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven. Talk about sometimes whether Jesus himself thought that he was God, or whether he just thought of himself as a good teacher. Well, good teachers don't talk about coming down from heaven. This is what Jesus said he has done. I am the bread. I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. 
and this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should lose none of all of those he's given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, everyone who looks to the cross, to the Son, and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I'll raise them up at that last day. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. I will raise them up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Well, everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God, meaning himself, he's from God. Only he has seen the Father. Truly, very truly, 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 I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Has it right now. You've got it. The belief is it. You are being fed bread from heaven. Your soul is being fed by believing that. It is eternal life and you've got it. I am the bread of life. He goes back to their example. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. They died. Because the body does die. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die, because we're talking about the soul. Jesus says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread's my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus says, truly, truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I'll raise them up at the last day. My flesh is real food for your soul. My blood is real drink for your spirit. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them, just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Jesus is calling us to feed on him. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, and on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Think about the Jewish restrictions on foods they could eat, on not eating the blood that was part of an animal, on the sanctity of human life on all sorts of things is so rigorous in purity. And he's saying, you have to eat my flesh and blood. So aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascending to where it was before, the bread of heaven going back up to heaven? The Spirit gives life, he says. The flesh counts for nothing. Again, don't spend ourselves feeding the flesh the spirit gives life the words i have spoken to you he said they are full of the spirit and life what is the work to believe jesus because the words that he's giving us are spirit and their life for our heart for our soul and yes he'll meet our needs our physical needs but his words give us spiritual life it's the thing that doesn't end we're supposed to be hungry for that we're supposed to feed on the words of god we're supposed to feed on it starve for it crave it love it relish it the words of god they're power and they change us The words I have spoken to you are not just vowels and consonants and syllables. They're not language. They're like living things coming out of him. They're full of spirit. They're full of life. We take in those words. We take in the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The spirit is the word of God. These words, they give us life. Yet there's some of you who don't believe. Go figure. How can he do this and have us not believe? How many times does he have to show us before we're going to believe? How many things does he have to say before we just say, okay, I'm just going to stop doing things my way and I'm going to do them yours? Lots. And it's a good thing he's patient because we need lots of chances, it appears. Myself, definitely included. He says Jesus had known, John writes, as an aside, Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. 
He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Is it an easy thing to put aside ourselves? Is it an easy thing to put aside our sins? Is it an easy thing to put aside our fears? Is it an easy thing to just turn our lives over to Jesus? Is it an easy thing to just believe all the words that he said? No, it's work. It's our work. It's our job. Let's do our job. Let's work hard at believing the words and feeding on the words of Jesus because then we'll take it in. The life comes. The warmth comes. The love comes when we take it in. We have to eat or we're going to starve. It's not possible unless God helps us with this. He says, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. If we think we just walk up to Jesus and be like, I'm ready. No. If we think, oh, I'll just decide to pick Jesus. No. If we think, oh, I'm just going to, of my own free will, just put down my sins and turn around a new life. That's not how it works. God has to help us come to him. It is not possible to stop being ourself, which is who we are. We're always going to be the same. We're people. People are people. People don't change. But God changes people. The Spirit changes people. Life, the words of life, Spirit-filled words of life go in, and when you take it in, it's not just a word anymore. It's changed. You have new eyes to see something. You, you come alive in a way. It's food for our soul. And unless we feed on Jesus, we're going to die. Our souls are going to die. So what happened? Say all of this, end of chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, from this time, from this moment, maybe right at that moment, Many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Not the crowds, his disciples, the people who thought they were Christians, the ones with him, not just the ones looking for food. Now, it's not the 12, because he's chosen these 12 as apostles. They're kind of set apart. The 12 don't leave him, but he had many disciples. Remember, he sends out 40 and 70 in these different groups of people. Disciples, we're here with Jesus. And at this statement, many of those left him. I think that can happen for us too. Sometimes we get faced with what it's going to cost to follow God. We get faced with the fact that we can't do it on our own and we bail. We're not supposed to walk out. He's not walking out on us. We're supposed to remain in him. Abide in him. He abides in us. So a lot of them just couldn't take it. That's not what I signed on for. That's not what I thought this relationship was about. I thought I was coming to get free barley loaves and I'm supposed to eat your flesh. I'm just going to pass on that. Thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be another Messiah that will come because you're probably going to kill by the Romans anyway. But he didn't. He didn't until he gave himself to be sacrificed for us as a martyr, as a redeemer, as a lamb for our sins and our job is not to do it again. Our job is not to do more to make salvation possible. Our job is to believe. We're supposed to believe. We're supposed to come back for his words. All right, so he turns to the 12. And I wonder how he asked this. You know, sometimes you can phrase it differently. You don't want to leave too, do you? Is it like, you don't want to leave too, do you? Or is it like, do you? Do you want to leave? you want to leave too? He knows their heart, but how did that sound to their ears? All these people just getting up and being like, this guy's a heretic. This guy's crazy. He's talking about cannibalism as a way to eternal life. Wow. I'll just buy my bread. I don't need free bread. He says, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter, who's kind of the spokesperson of the apostles, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, where are we going to go? Who are we going to go to? We've got no other options. There's no plan B. Or to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Powerful words filled with spirit that feed our soul. We've come to believe. We've, we've seen enough. I've seen enough. I've felt enough. The Father has helped us. We've come to believe and to know you're the Holy One of God. We believe. Our work to believe, we've gotten there. We've got some point of belief. But Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. And they continue on from that. That's supposed to be our response. We're supposed to be like the twelve. We're not supposed to be like the crowds that come looking for a handout. Jesus, help me. 
I've made a real mess of my finances by way too many scratch tickets and bad investing and all sorts of spending and wasteful living, but I really could use a bailout right now. Give me some barley loaves. I need some food. We're not supposed to be like the crowd. We're not supposed to be like Philip, who says, I don't see a financial way to accomplish this, this will of God thing you speak of, feeding the people. How will money accomplish that? We're not supposed to be like Andrew even, who says, well, there's some help here, but you know, it's really not enough, Lord. You see that there's not enough here. We're not supposed to be like the disciples who said, okay, well, I'm willing to follow you, but I'm supposed to believe everything you say? Even when it's something like I'm supposed to eat your flesh? Even though Jesus talked in parables all the time. He's got too hard and they left. We're not supposed to be like that. And we can't be like Jesus. We can't know that the barley loaves are going to multiply. He knew. We can't know. We, we're, we're watching. <laughs> are they going to break into enough pieces? I don't know. We don't have the world, words of life ourselves. We need to eat them. We need to take them. So we can't be like Jesus. We're not supposed to be like the crowds. We're not supposed to be like Philip. We're not supposed to be like Andrew. We're not supposed to be like the disciples that left. We're not supposed to be like Judas. Enough said. So who's left in this story for us to identify with? The disciples, the 12, the 11. Lord, where are we going to go? Honestly. We're going to go back to fishing now after we've seen this? We're going to go back to tax collecting when we don't even have the, our conscience would be stricken to go back to our old business practice that we left? We're going to go find another Messiah when we've seen you do what no one else can do? Where are we going to go? There is no option. There's no alternative. That's good. That's good. That's how it should be for us in our marriages. That's how it should be for us in our faith. That's how it should be for us in our ministries. Well, there's no other option than to just do what God calls us to. There's no other option. There's no plan B. We'll just we'll do it. I don't know how. Money's not there. Resources aren't there. But I'm not going to quit. I am going to see God do miraculous things because only he can and we know that you've got the words of life. We've seen it. We've tasted it. Taste and know that the Lord is good. We've been there. So keep coming back for more. Feed on his words. You don't expect that a meal you had last week is going to keep feeding you today. Why would we expect it to be any different for our soul? If you don't keep feeding your soul, your soul is going to just wither away. It'll be up to God, I guess, when he sees a soul that ate once. Be like, is there any life left in that shriveled thing? He would know. We wouldn't know. But it's definitely not going to be alive. And it's definitely not going to be healthy. And it's not going to be growing. There's going to be no life in it. So is that what we want? Is that what we've signed up for as Christians? Nothing different. That's kind of the option, right? If there's nothing spiritual in us, then we're just human. Then we can rely on our finances. We can rely on our resources. We can quit if we need to. We're just doing the human options. There's supposed to be something more than that. Jesus is supposed to give us a different option. And I was struck for myself over these past couple of weeks being away and just sort of reflecting and thinking that I, I don't hunger enough for Jesus. That craving. I love him. I trust him. I've seen him come through. I'm definitely not walking out on him. But there's another level of hunger. When something's good to eat and you crave it, you get like a taste. I could really go for a fill in the blank. We're supposed to have that for Jesus because his words are these powerful, beautiful things. This is a powerful, beautiful thing. Take it or leave it. Eat or not. But where else are you going to go? And where else am I going to go? So we need to be like Joshua. Choose this day who you will follow. As for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't think there's any place else we can go to get what he offers. And what he offers is a hard job, but it's very simple in a way, too. Believe him. Believe him. Take in his words. Believe it. Get life from it. Grow. Have joy. Just let him give you those things. But it takes believing him and following him, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's not what we want to do. It's him first, then us. His word into our hearts. And then our soul comes to life. Music team, would you come forward? I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. And we'll close our service with song. Jesus, I thank you for your words. They are full of spirit, filled with spirit. Your words are rich. And we need them. 
and we can't exist without continually having more of them. Help us not to be satisfied with the little bit of you that we know and have. Help us to be hungry for you. Help us to love you more. Help us to spend time with you. Help us to eat of you. And I pray that you bring our hearts back to life. And if they've died, if they've gotten hardened, only you can soften. So please, soften us. Make us gentle. Give us love where we don't feel it. Forgive us. Make us holy. Give us your spirit. And give us a, a good, firm grasp of that eternal life which only you can provide. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.